This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Dating has changed a lot over the years, from traditional matchmaking in your own community to being set up on blind dates, to the 1980s newspaper ads, the rise of online dating and whatever else is next. Today, I'm speaking to the incredibly awesome Kerry Sackville, who's an accomplished author, columnist, a divorced mother of three, and has a fabulous new book out called Out There, A Survival Guide for Dating in Midlife. Kerry is known for being candid and insightful, and I anticipate nothing less here in her deeply personal account of what she's learned in a dating world gone mad. Welcome to the program, Kerry. Oh, so lovely to be here with you. So I'm going to start with some, uh, maybe some cringeworthy moments, but your early life romance, were you one of those girls that had lots of childhood crushes or the serious first boyfriend that broke your heart? Yeah. Can you share a little bit about those early days of, of dating? Both of those. I remember having a mad crush on a boy in UK. So, you know, the year before year one, that's how early I started falling in love. Uh, it, it, and you do remember this? I remember it so clearly. His name was Theo and I remember sitting on the steps of the kindergarten because his parents were moving him into state and I remember literally praying to God to keep Theo in school because I loved him so much. And from then on there were just a series. I always was in love with someone. I remember in year four, no, year three, I was in love with a boy called Martin Hunter. Um, that was I, I was living overseas that year, and that was my really my, my most poignant and sharp memory from my year overseas uh, at the age of eight. And I continued to have mad crushes on boys all through school, and I had no success with any of them till after school. So, one of my probably my strongest feeling about love and romance is of unrequited love. Even though I've had many relationships, I've been married and. And um, been in relationships, you know, I was in relationships consistently till I was about 45 from the time I was 17. But my earliest experiences were always of pining for people who didn't love me back. So for three years in high school. Oh, my heart's breaking. Oh, yeah, for three (laughs) years in high school. I call him, him, I've written a bit about him, I called him Josh Goldenbum in in all my writing. That wasn't his real (laughs) name, but it it really should have been. And I was madly in love with this Josh Goldenbum for about three years from the age of 14 to 17. And I, he never looked at me. He dated all the girls in my year, it felt like, then the girls in the year below and then the girls in the year above and never me. And that's my that's what I carry with me still is that feeling of, of loving people who don't love me back. Isn't that sad? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well... Obviously, you get a little bit older and in your 20s, it sounds like you met someone you thought would be the forever mate. Well, actually, I met him I met him earlier than that. I met him when I was 14 and we okay. still around each other. We started dating um, when I was 17 and we went out for three years. He was the love of my life. He broke up with me when I was 20 after three years together and it broke my heart. I thought I would just die of grief. And then I ended up having a couple of other relationships and we reunited about six years later. We reunited when I was about 26 and we got married. Wow. So that's huge. And I guess in between you said you dated a couple of other people. Were you kind of the rebound dating girl or did you sort of hope these were going to turn into the one? Were you that sort of person? The one directly after my now ex-husband, my then boyfriend and I broke up was definitely a rebound. And it was fantastic. It was, it was great. I had a great time. It still to this day is one of the, the best, most uncomplicated relationships of my life. I was I was 20 and I was 21 and, and he was just a lovely, lovely, very good looking, very sweet boy. Um, and I had a great time with him for about nine months. But then he wanted to marry me and I was like, oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is not my forever relationship. And then I had another relationship, which I did think was going to be my forever relationship. And that was for a few years. And and um, then I realised, no, that wasn't. And then my ex-boyfriend came back into my life and it was fate. <laughs> and we had a, we, wow. yeah, we, we were married for 17 years. So that's I've written about this 
and I really do feel this quite passionately, that relationships aren't failures because they don't last forever. You know, he was the love of my life and, and for a long time we had an amazing marriage and, and I don't regret that for one second. That's great. You can reflect with, with that because it does feel like I think people have this idea that, yes, because it's ended, it's somehow been a failure. But it sounds like for you, you've got that continuity of, of belief that, well, this is just part of the story of, of the dating journey that you might now find yourself back oh, in. Um, just to backtrack, backtracking a little bit, um, like you, I'm Jewish. Yep. So the idea that you're going to marry a Jewish person is very strongly imbued in you as a young yeah. woman or man. Yeah. Do you think in the modern society we're in, we're in where there's so much choice, there's almost too much choice I think sometimes. If I was back out there dating, I don't know what I'd do. Um, but is it the idea that it can be a bit of a blessing to have that common grounding that you've got this smaller pool of people to choose yes. from because really at the end of the day there may not be the one, there just might be a, a series of people. So if you've kind of got some commonality, it does help. That's so much and I think that's so interesting because back before online dating, people generally – met and married people who were very close to them. So you would end up, you know, back in the 60s and, and before that, people would, would marry someone who lived down the road, you know, or you'd marry someone you'd gone to school with, you'd marry someone from work. Online dating has changed all of that. So we have this incredibly wide range. You, you can meet somebody from, from a different country, you know, let alone just someone who doesn't live down the road from you or doesn't have share many common interests. So, you know, when I was growing up and I was dating, I did date Jewish men, I mixed with Jewish men. It was a much smaller pool, but I, it wasn't a problem. It was an immediate shorthand with these people. Um, I knew them, they knew me. Um, it felt very familiar. And even now when I meet Jewish men, uh, and I haven't dated a lot of Jewish men over the past few years, but I have dated a couple, and it does immediately give you that shorthand. And I think most people would feel that with people from their own cultural background, whatever that background is, that you do immediately start off not just at, at the starting point that you do with most people when it's it's a first date. You start a bit ahead of that. You know, you've got shared values, shared cultural identity. Um, you often know a lot of the same people and you just get certain things about each other that, that don't need to be explained. And I think that was really helpful. And, and when I think back to, to, you know, was it important for me to marry a Jewish person? I didn't think about it. They were the guys that I was meeting and hanging with and, and, um, and had things in common with. And I would meet non-Jewish men, but I always gravitated towards the Jewish ones because they felt familiar and they felt comfortable and they felt like home. Um, and it did make it, I, I think having that small pool, actually th there are some advantages to that because, as you said, I, I don't believe in, in the one because if there was the one, what if you lived in Afghanistan or, or you know, Spain and I'd never meet him? I think there are a lot of different people and, and having less choice it encourages you to focus more on the people who are there and give them more of a go. And my, my ex-husband, you know, when he when we first started dating, I wasn't sure about him and he really worked hard to to make me you know, fall in love with him, I guess. And and so I gave him more of a chance because he was there, he was in my crowd and, and he was familiar and you know, three kids later I think I think we did pretty well. Excellent. So after your divorce, what was your initial approach to dating? I always have this kind of very calculated theory that a lot of men will repartner very quickly and a lot of women are quite happy for a bit of solitude and eat, pray, love moments. So for you, what was the experience? I hate eat, pray, love, so I didn't post my moments. I, I have to say I've written about that a lot in the book. It, it is absolutely true. Men tend to jump straight into dating after their relationship ends. And, and of course, most men um, are left in relationships, most men are the ones who are left. The wife generally leaves because when men leave relationships, they leave for someone else. So the men who are in the dating pool have been left. All, and not entirely, there's always exceptions, but you know, the vast majority of men who leave relationships already have a partner lined up because they can't be alone. Whereas women tend to take time out to uh, settle themselves, to settle the kids, to find their feet. And, yeah, if you're into eat, pray, love, you know, go meditate on a hill or whatever. I was sort of more like you know, watching reality TV and eating chocolate. Um, but I actually, I, yeah. Richard yeah, Jones yeah, yeah, style. That's who I went to, yeah, gaining weight. And <laughs> I didn't smoke, but I, I did drink a bit. So I actually jumped straight into a relationship with an old friend. I didn't intend to. Uh, I think he was, he was there. He was keen. It was easy. Uh, but it was, of course, a complete disaster because, you're just a mess after divorce and, and really the best thing to do is to take time out for yourself and that's what I now recommend. I didn't do that but I should have done that because it, it 
caused me probably more pain in the end than, than joy. But then I took time to, to sort myself out. And then I really had no intention of, of dating. It wasn't something that I thought about, but I was literally at home one night feeling really restless, really bored, really antsy. And it was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join a dating site. I'm going to do it. Uh, and it was about six months, I think, out from my, my separation. And so I tried to uh, start an eHarmony profile and I you know, got onto the site, downloaded photos, started a profile, put my age and details and stuff. But then it kept asking me questions, more and more questions. You know, eHarmony requires a lot of information to build a profile. It was like, what's your ideal date? Is it A, walking on the beach at sunset, B, movie and popcorn, C? And I just felt felt overwhelmed. I felt anxious. It just felt too much commitment, too scary. And I shut the whole thing down. And I thought, no, forget it. Can't do it. Can't do it. And then the next night I'm lying in my bed and I'm feeling antsy and restless and bored. And so I downloaded Tinder to my phone and within like three minutes I was swiping. (laughs) So that's how I began. Oh, and I guess... That sort of leads me to the question about why you decide to write this book about midlife dating survival. I mean, the rules are a bit different once you've had your kids and you're not looking maybe for the, you know, someone to mate with. You're looking yeah. for something else. And does something like Tinder really <laughs> fill that gap or was it kind of something else that you need? I wasn't really sure what I was looking for when I was dating. I just knew I was bored and wanted male company and wanted to flirt and feel sexy and alive again, I guess. Um, You know, I had moments of feeling lonely, but it really wasn't thought out. I did it quite impulsively. But I know that I just really wanted male company. And the reason I wrote the book is because the experience of online dating at this age is so fantastically crazy and so different to anything that people my age are used to. You know, I, I, I was first dating when I was in my late teens and early 20s and then I was married for 17 years and we were together for longer than that so I had almost 20 years of being in a relationship and it it was just like walking into a parallel universe I didn't know anything about how it worked you know I didn't know who to swipe on and who not to swipe on I didn't know who to chat to and who not to chat to who to go on a date with and who to decline how to go on a date what do you do on a first date how do you conduct yourself? How do you deal with rejection? How do you reject people? What are all these things that men are doing? Why are they saying these things and doing these things? Why are they dropping out of contact? Why are they sending me these weird messages? It was like being an alien, you know, in in the, the human world. Wow. <laughs> and I was looking and looking for advice and for like guides on how to deal with all this and there was nothing because all the advice and there's tons of dating advice out there but it's all for young women you know and it, it's all like it, it, a lot of it comes out of the United States and it's, it's aimed at yes. college age women and and then women who are, who are trying to find a partner to as you said to mate with like find someone to have children with there was nothing for middle-aged women about how to negotiate this and the behaviors are so bizarre I mean yeah, the ghosting, like people who, who message you and then drop out of contact or the, the men who who are just there to hook up or um, the men who are really recently separated and are complete messes and, and um, are just desperate for someone, anyone to partner with. Um, the men who are players and who just want to go and, and have lots of sex with lots of different people and, and you're wasting your time if you want a relationship. You know, the difference between wanting casual sex and wanting a relationship and how to make clear what you do want, the politics of all of that. Like, how do you go about casual sex? It's you know, When you've been in a relationship for a long time, you, you, know, you, you don't really know how to, how to do all those things. So I just wanted to, to write the book that I wish that I had access to, um, to explain how it all works, to explain what the red flags are, to, to explain how to, how to select people, how to conduct yourself, how to interpret what's going on, how to keep yourself safe emotionally, um, safe physically, obviously, because it just wasn't there. Absolutely. I sometimes think it was simpler back in the day when you didn't almost have this online feast of dating options and the swiping and the intensity. And I can imagine it can almost take over your life because you're maintaining all these kind of personas in a way and trying to decide the right people to, to even go out with <laughs> in case they're a serial killer or something like that, all which the, I guess has always been there. Who I speak to say, oh, aren't you scared of like the serial killers? And that's... I, I, 
Actually, yeah. you wrote a line in the book. You said that your risk of dying from online dating is very slim. You know, you t- it's, it's like with anything. You wouldn't meet a man. In, well, some people do. But if you're sensible, you're not going to meet, walk into a bar and meet a man and go straight to his apartment. You know, you're going to take steps to, to check that you know who he is and he's safe and you're safe. You're not going to meet a man online and say, right, yeah, let's, I'm going to go to your apartment. You're going to meet a man online. You're going to... You're going to uh, chat to him, suss him out. You're going to check out his profile online. You're going to verify who he is. You're going to meet in a coffee shop. You're going to then progress to dinner. So it's it's, it's actually the, the risk of, of being killed by serial killer is not that big, but the risk of being hurt emotionally is, is the problem. Yeah, yeah. Is greater, of course. I mean, mean, statistically, that's not likely to happen. So do you have some dating criteria these days? Like I remember in my sort of early 20s, you know, people would be like, oh, you need to have the checklist of what you want so you can attract it. So you'd write down this kind of really fictitious bloke that you'd want to find who (laughs) had to have a secure job and nice family, nice to his mum, Jewish, whatever. What's your criteria these days? I had I had criteria and I realised that it was all just, I had the wrong criteria. Um, I was looking for, I was very focused on very bright, successful men who were, who were a bit edgy and exciting and, and obviously good looking if possible, but I've certainly dated men who aren't good looking at all. Um, but for me it was always the intellect and, and the intellectual stimulation and really super confident and and. What I've discovered is that those men aren't necessarily great relationship material. They're really exciting and and and, and stimulating, but they tend to that, that tends to come with that kind of ambition and that kind of success and that kind of intellect tends to come with arrogance and self absorption and they're you know, not great for relationships. Um, so I guess the first thing that I, I look for is that, that there are no red flags. So that's the big one. So um, they're not very recently separated, they're not players, they're not liars, um, they're not secretly married, um, there are a whole lot of red flags. But then in terms of my criteria, I, I've really narrowed it down to the very, very basics and what I look for now is someone whose company I really, really enjoy uh, and that encompasses everything. So if you enjoy someone's company, um, that, that covers the intellect and the humour and all of that because you're not going to enjoy their company if they don't have a sense of humour and they're not smart and, and they're not interesting. So I would know to someone whose company I really enjoy and someone I feel emotionally safe with, and that's the, that's the key. There are there are men who I really um, enjoy hanging out with and I feel really good with them, but I know that that they don't have my back and they're not really interested in my you know my life or my kids or or um, being there for the long haul. They're just interested in a bit of fun. So yeah, that, and you're wise enough now to know the difference too. Yeah, but I wasn't for a long time. And how can you be if you've got no experience with it? So it took a long time for me to work out that just because I really enjoy someone's company or we have great sex or, you know, we laugh together, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be in a relationship. Um, you know, just because he wants to take me out and then take me back to his place doesn't mean that he's falling in love with me. Um, and just because I really enjoy someone's company doesn't mean that he's going to be a good partner in the long term. So you learn all these things through through experience and trial and error and, and um, getting knocked around a bit, I think, and you get wise. So you have mentioned there are some red flags for you of people you won't date. Um, perhaps they're not the best choice for you. And if you were to give wi- other women out there in that, that midlife dating scene, what would be your kind of safety tips for them in terms of making sure that they don't get hurt or that they're not sort of getting into something which is not the best for them? I think – Stay clear or be very, very careful with, with men who are very recently separated. Um, be extremely cautious about men who are still living with their partners. I wouldn't date them. Uh, I think that there are a lot Oh, my of, goodness. Do people do that? Oh, people do that all the time. And, in fact, it's, it's something that I write about a lot that, that you really need to ask the question. When they say they are separated, you need to say, are you actually living apart from your partner? Because a lot of men will say that they're separated and what they mean by that is that, oh, we haven't had sex in a long time or, oh, we're probably going to separate or, oh, we're emotionally detached from each other. But they're still living in the same house. Often they're still in the same room. And often the the wife doesn't actually know that they're separated. So you've got to be really careful and you've got to ask the hard questions. Uh, Sometimes when we meet someone that we really like, we almost don't want to know. We we want to just assume that things will go well and and 
they're on the same track as us, but you have to ask, are you actually separated? Are you living in separate places? Does your wife know you're separated? And proceed from there. And the other thing is to always, always check if you're on the same page in terms of what you want, because some people are out there looking for relationships. Other people are just out there looking for fun or looking for casual sex. A lot of men are out there just looking to see if what the landscape looks like to reassure themselves that there will be people there when they're ready. And so if a woman is looking for a relationship and he's just looking around or looking to have fun or just looking for sex, it, it's going to end in tears. So if you're just looking for sex too, that's great. You're on the same page, but you need to check that you both want the same thing. Do you just ask? I mean, this just sounds like stuff that people might, it's a bit nuanced. So do people hide the reality of what they really want? Because sometimes they don't know. I think in, in my experience and, and the experience of the many, many women that I've talked to and, and um, have written, uh, you know, I've written so many articles and had response from people. And then I, I talked to my friends and I talked to people online. Generally, I think when you ask the direct question, what are you looking for? People, are, men are pretty honest about it. They'll fudge other things. They'll fudge their height. They'll fudge their age. They'll fudge their marital status. But when you ask a specific question, are you looking for a relationship or are you looking to hook up or are you looking for fun? They'll be honest and they'll say things like, I'm looking for my long-term partner. I'm looking for my forever person. Um, Or they'll say something like, uh, at this point, just looking to have fun. Or they'll say things like, I don't know, Um, I'm really just looking around at this point, but, you know, I'm open to something happening. That I would take more as a, I don't know, I'm probably not ready for a relationship. But they they will generally tell you outright if they're looking for a long-term relationship or something else. And if it's something else, then proceed with, with real caution because you're not going to turn somebody who's not interested in a relationship into someone who wants commitment. Um, it's not about no, you. You can't heal not. them with your love. You can't, you know, uh, seduce them with your magic vagina. Like either they will be <laughs> in the market for a relationship or they won't be. And we all know stories about men and it, it's happened to me where they're not interested in commitment, they're not interested in commitment, they string you along for ages and then magically one day, of course, they turn around and, yes, they commit to someone else. But they commit to the person they're with at the time when they're ready to to settle down. Um, and if they're not in that in that place, then you're not going to convert them. So don't waste your time and your emotional energy. That's great advice. So have you had any special mentors or inspirational people that have guided you throughout this magic journey of your career and your life? And and they don't have to be well-known or famous. Often they're people in your own families that can support you. So who are they and what have they taught you on this on this journey that we're on? You know what? I wish I could say that I had people in my life who taught me and mentored me. I didn't. I really felt like I was all alone. And, again, that's why I wrote the book because I was the only divorced friend in my group apart from one other person who really wasn't looking for, for what I was looking for at, at that time. I don't think she was even dating when I started dating. She just wasn't interested. And I really didn't know anybody who was in my position. Now, of course, I have friends. Now I've made single friends who who are with me on the journey and we share stories with each other. But none of us are really knew what we were doing. We all learnt by, by mistake. I can say that I read a lot of work by um, a woman called Natalie Liu, L-U-E, who writes a blog called Baggage Reclaim, um, and she's written a couple of books on relationships for which are really pertinent to women my age. And one of them in particular is called Mr. Unavailable and the Fallback Girl, uh, which I just love because I had a pattern of, after my divorce, getting into relationships with men who were emotionally unavailable, and I didn't understand the dynamic. I didn't know what I was doing. So it would be men who very recently separated, for example, and weren't in the market for a relationship or men where I was their rebound girl, I was their transitional woman. Um, and I found her work really empowering and, and um, I guess helped to, to explain to me that whole concept of how some men just aren't available for a relationship and you don't waste your time trying to force them into a relationship. So I think she was really insp- in, oh, in, instrumental in helping me to, to sort out um, what the journey was. I love, I love Cheryl Strayed and her book, uh, tiny beautiful things. There was a, all her stuff on relationships in there is is wonderful. I and I, I've talked to a lot of women now, and and we, you know, we share stories. And what I've found is that we all have the same story. So just knowing that anything I've been through, whether it was with a guy who turned out to be married, or whether it was a man who who was emotionally unavailable, or a player, or or someone who you know it was just stringing me along 
um, and I thought that we had a relationship when we weren't, you know, all of my experiences or, or being ghosted or being zombie, you know, there were other women who had exactly the same experiences. So just for me, sharing my stories with those women was really, really helpful. Um, but I had to be my own guide, which was really tough. But it, you know, the, the good thing is that I can now, I think, help other people because I, I had five years of sorting it all out. Absolutely. We can all benefit from your your pitfalls and, and your advice as well. So just to wrap up, what would be your top tip or your best advice for anyone navigating the politics of dating and especially midlife dating? I think that the top piece of advice is to make sure that you're ready. Um, and that means make sure that you're okay on your own. It's very, very tempting to jump out and want to start dating when you're feeling lonely, when you're feeling frightened of being alone, when your life is in turmoil and you just want something to distract you, when you're grieving your ex-partner and, you know, you don't want to feel bad anymore so you want to seek comfort, I guess, in a, in a new relationship. Be really careful doing that because really to be okay in, on the dating scene, you have to be okay in yourself. And as much as it drove me crazy when people were saying things to me like, you have to be okay on your own. And I was like, I don't want to be on my own. I don't want to be okay on my own. But you really have to be okay in yourself before you can start dealing with other people because dating requires a bit of resilience. There is almost inevitably there's rejection along the line. Um, there's dealing with somebody else's baggage as well as yours. And if you're a wreck, if you're desperate, if you're frightened, if you're lonely, if you're grieving, you're not going to make good decisions um, and you're not going to choose the right people. You're going to choose people out of desperation and need instead of desire and you're just going to be setting yourself up for for unhappy relationships or, or relationships where you compromise your boundaries and you compromise your desires and needs because you're so desperate to be with someone else. So take time out, be okay in yourself and then try to have fun. Try to approach each date not as, oh, maybe this is this is the man of my dreams, maybe this is my next lifetime partner and try instead to, to get something good out of the experience just for that night. So whatever it is. So it might be going to a nice restaurant with somebody and having a nice glass of wine. It might be enjoying meeting somebody who's who's from a different background to you or, or who has interesting work stories or who's got some funny tales to tell about his own dating experiences. So when you try and take that pressure off yourself to make sure this is the one, oh my God, is this gonna, you know, is this gonna work? Is this gonna be a relationship? And turn it instead into I hope I have a fun night and see what happens after that. It Absolutely. Makes much easier. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you do want to connect further with Kerry Sackville, there will be some details on our show notes, including how to grab her new book, which sounds awesome for anyone who's out there doing the dating thing in midlife, which is a lot of people, I believe, seeing one and two marriages and ending in divorce these yeah. days. It's been fabulous to speak to you today, Kerry. You too. Until next time. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.